Z TV. How's everybody doing? How's everybody this morning? I, I, I know everybody's tired. You guys are an amazing group. You're bright eyed and bushy tailed. You're bright eyed and bushy tailed. And the plan today is uh, I'm going to ask Scott last night to give us another message this morning. So Scott's, uh, Scott Hicko is going to address us, and then we're going to take a break, and I will address us, and then we'll ask these people what they're laughing about back <laughs> And share it with us. <laughs> and then uh, we will sadly close the conference. Unless we have time for a discussion Q&A, that'd be fine too. Now, I really kicked myself yesterday for not, mention, not distinguishing what money bucket was for what. But if you have not already contributed to the expenses, if you would like to, it's not required, of course, but if you would like to contribute, the wicker basket is for that. Uh, so if, if you have any money left, I don't know how anybody <laughs> would have any money left after this trip. And I do appreciate that. I know the sacrifice that you go to financially, your, your time, some of you have to get off work. And so it's a, it's a big hassle. So I, we did not expect this many people. This is so great. I was such a surprise to see how many of the saints showed up and so uh, this was been this has been a really one of the top of uh, the tops as mm -hmm. far as conferences go and it wouldn't be happening it would not be happening without jack and tracy branham yeah. please sir. i told them it's not an easy thing uh, organizing a conference now you know now you know <laughs> But uh, they, they, they've been champions, just stalwarts and hospitality. Besides setting everything up for you here and getting this hall, they've also shown hospitality to all of us every evening going to their home. And of course, Catherine and I have been staying there at the Branham Hilton, so very appreciative of that. So um, if at the last minute here at the 12th hour, you want to help them, that wicker basket is for conference expenses. The other basket, again, if you want to, help pay for the books that's fine but I'd rather you put it to the collection of the hall I would rather you do that because there's still live every man's battle out here so um, buy some for your friends I sh I'm sure you know people are struggling with this issue so please buy some for people that you know and um, I want you to take the first idiot in heaven just take them take them and give them out Leave them places, be sneaky, have fun, you know, uh, it's because we're going to bring the last member into the body of Christ here sometime soon. That's, that's my plan. Let's see if it's God's plan. All right, Scott Hick, Scott, come on up, sir. Come on up. You can find Scott Hicko on YouTube. How often do you publish? Five days a week? No, I'd say once every two, three, four days. Okay, every two, or th every two to four days, Scott publishes a video on YouTube, and I've seen them, and they're excellent. He gets right to the truth, right to the point, and he's, you're a good speaker, my friend. It's amazing that yesterday, yesterday was the first time you spoke publicly. It was. Oh, that's amazing. Well, I appreciate that. And today, and now this is the second time. Here we go. All right. You know what that goes. Yep. No I'll, fish I'll tacos in here. All right, so Martin had asked me to speak last night, um, and we had a bit of a laugh because I originally had about a half hour planned, and then he said to, you know, go about 25 minutes or something like that. And that's fine because I had about 10 minutes of things in my notes praising Martin, so I just threw that stuff out. <laughs> well, you want to limit my time? Don't need that. Don't need that. Let's move on. <laughs> but I do want to thank Martin um, because as I went into my studies, uh, watching his videos and reading his books really um, taught me a lot, and especially on the two Gospels. And that was kind of the last truth that I came into. I wanted to focus on you know, sal the salvation of all, you know, human free will, the lack of it, um, understanding what death was and talking about that. And I kind of wanted to leave the two Gospels out of it because that is going to be too confusing I think for people 
<clears throat> and the more I started talking to people and doing videos, I realized you can't communicate the truth without explaining that because there's too much misunderstanding that goes on when you don't rightly divide the word. And Martin has done a great job with that first idiot in heaven um, and with the other things that he does. So thank you very much. And um, all the comments that I've received, both on the videos and in person uh, last couple days, uh, with all of you, just seeing you um, and actually having eye-to-eye -eye contact and communication with people that believe the same things I believe is just amazing. So every one of you, I appreciate every kind word. It, it goes a long way, more than, more than you know. So thank you very much. And Jack and Tracy, last night was awesome. You put that together so we could all do that. So it was awesome. Thank you. So when Martin asked me to speak, I said, I don't really know what I want to talk about. So I went to my scripture that is used the most. So I looked through the pages and saw which was worn the most. And you see, I've lost both covers here. <laughs> that, was, that was from a day of frustration where it was just like, wipe it clean. I don't know what's going on here and reset. So this thing has been through a lot. But the most worn page is Ephesians chapter 1 for me. And... Ephesians chapter 1, first of all, I love because you cannot read it and have any doubt that human free will does not exist. I mean, Paul is obnoxious about using the word beforehand and designated beforehand. He says it like nine, ten times in different spots using different words. So it completely disproves human free will. It rivals... Romans chapter 9, which Romans chapter 9 is, is fascinating to me as well, because I don't understand the human free will debate, because it's actually debated in Romans chapter 9. It's debated and then it's answered. No, you don't have free will. You are clay. God is the potter. It's answered. So there's really no debate. You don't have to debate with anybody about free will. You just give them Romans chapter 9. If they're going to believe it, Okay, they accept the truth. If they're not, then they're just not. They're just denying the words on the pages. But Ephesians chapter 1 is great um, for many reasons. Being a special education teacher, my last job before I had the one here, I worked in the inner city. And um, the greatest failure, I think, of the education system, um, and I've been a teacher now for 17 years, and it's horrible because I see it in, on a one-on-one -on -one basis is the fact that kids are not taught about God. They're not taught about spirituality in any sense, so they don't explore it at all. And these kids that I work with, come, they came from really bad situations. And these are the people that needed something to hope in because they had nothing in their lives. They didn't have a good family life. They didn't have a good, uh, most of them didn't have dads you know, things like that. So it was very difficult for them. So when I got them one-on-one, -on -one and talk, I talked to them a little bit about Jesus, saying that there was hope, that they're going through this pain, and there's a purpose behind it. And God's going to take care of all that through Jesus Christ. And you could see, you know, I'm not saying anyone changed in a great big way, but you could see some hope coming through their eyes. And I remember I, I used to have this, minivan and after the basketball games a lot of kids would be st standing around and I would take sometimes 12 kids home in my minivan just pile them up take them home and I remember this one kid who was a real behavior problem for me in class um, he was one of the kids that I that I took home and so I took him home you know whatever took all the kids home came back the next day you know I'm in class with them and the kids were kind of rowdy there's just fight in the hall so they're all coming back in you know everyone's talking and all this and I'm trying to get them situated they're not listening to me and this big guy he's a big dude he's about 6'3 built like a like a tank talk like Mike Tyson too he had <laughs> missing teeth too so he he's not a dude that I want to get in the way of if he's trying to fight someone but he stands up and says hey and this is a kid I had problems with before wouldn't listen to me before 
stands up and says, hey, Mr. Hickel said to be quiet. The whole class just <laughs> sits down. He, he nods and goes and sits down. All that kid needed was a little bit of a family presence. That's all he needed. And relationship by relationship was built by me doing that and, and other teachers doing that. And it wasn't anything that major, but it's something that those kids haven't seen in their life. And that's one of the reasons why I hate the Trinity so much. Besides the fact that it denies the death of Jesus Christ, it denies the purpose of God in creating a family. Because we know that God is not a trinity. He is creating a family, and he's creating a family through his son, Jesus Christ. And I know some of you know Ace Theo. I know uh, me and Dale were talking uh, a second ago. Um, but he always asked the question, what is the purpose of God? And I believe the answer to that question is Jesus Christ. Everything that we are and everything we're going to be can be summed up in Jesus Christ. That's his purpose, to create us through Jesus Christ. So if we look in Ephesians chapter 1, it says, In Christ, this is verse 4, according as he chooses us in him before the disruption of the world, we to be holy and flawless in his sight, in love designating us beforehand for the place of a son for him through Jesus Christ. So he's designated us as a son. And that's pretty special. When you talk to people and understand that one day you will be a son, you will be a daughter of God. For people that have no hope, who are going through difficult times, to have that expectation of being a son and daughter of God is pretty amazing. Instead of looking at God as something that's going to be above you and separate from you for all eternity. And if you go to Romans um, chapter 8, starting verse 28, now this again is talking about what God's doing. I think in these three scriptures, he, as in God doing this for us, is mentioned nine times. It says, now we are aware that God is working all together for the good of those who are loving God, who are called according to the purpose that whom he foreknew he designates beforehand, also to be conformed to the image of his son, for him to be the firstborn among many brethren. Now whom he designates beforehand, these he calls also, and whom he calls, these he justifies also. Now whom he justifies, these he glorifies also. So for him to be the firstborn among many brethren. So Jesus Christ went through the process. He was in the Garden of Gethsemane. And that garden is one of the most fascinating stories, places on earth for me. Because of what Jesus Christ went through. He... The rubber met the road at that point. And I remember we go to this place, it's the Shrine of Christ's Pas Passion with my kids. I have to tell this story. It's, it's really uh, extravagant. It's put on by this rich Catholic family uh, by my house. And they have the Stations of the Cross. They have like a big tomb of uh, Jesus. And they have, you know, statues of uh, Pilot and Jesus bound. I mean, it's very ornate and extravagant. And uh, the first time we went there, my son, they had the, the Last Supper and all the apostles sitting around, and he, he um, jumped up on the roof and started climbing around, and the Catholics got upset and kicked us out. But uh, the, second time, the second time we went there, by far the most intriguing part of that place was the Garden of Gethsemane. When my kids walked in, you walked down this path, they saw the three apostles laying down. They had statues of them laying down. And then about 20 yards over, Jesus was praying. And, you know, I had the conversation with them of, of what happened in that garden where it was getting real for Jesus. And he went 
to God three times to pray. You know, if there's any other way that this can be done, let's do it. And he heard nothing. But because of his faith, and even when our faith fails, because of his faith that night at the garden to be apprehended, to go through what he knew he was going to go through that next day, to die and not exist for three days, and have that faith that God would raise him from the dead. And when he did that, that sealed the deal. He's the firstborn. And we're all coming into that because we participate in what he did. Like the big brother, he went to the tomb first and he busted out of it. And he's bringing all of his children with him. And if you tell people that, you give them that message. I'm telling you, the kids that I spoke with, they didn't truly grasp it, but there was hope because of what Jesus did, not because they had to follow rules or they had to do this and that in order to achieve what Jesus did. The big brother did it for them. And then if you look at um, Romans 8, you know, 18 through 25, I'm, I'm not going to read it all here, but the great thing is, is that we are the first fruits. We are chosen first to come into the glorious freedom of God. Not in order to damn the rest or hold it over everybody else, but in order to be used by Jesus to bring in the rest. So we're the first fruits. We're the big brothers in a sense. And now we're bringing the rest of creation home to this realization of what Jesus Christ has done. And I, I always say it, I try to mention it every time in my videos, but it, it, it's such a, a huge thing to say, is that we are saved by the faith of Jesus Christ, his death, his entombment, and his resurrection. And we're all going to go through that. We participate in that death. So when Jesus was taken up by God, so will we. So looking at um, the other great, there's many great scriptures in Paul's letters, but probably pretty close to my favorite is the complete package of 1 Corinthians 15, 22 through 28. And that's the beauty. I love telling people, that Jesus Christ gives up his reign. You know, I know the Christian belief is, oh, he will reign forever and ever. Well, you don't hear this in Sunday school or, or anywhere else, that Jesus will give up his reign. But that is so powerful because Jesus Christ gives up his reign for family. Because God, through Jesus Christ, created all things. And now Jesus Christ did what he did, and through his death, entombment, and resurrection, all of his family is coming home. And it's a family. It's not going to be Jesus ruling over us, where we have to follow rules, do all this. It's going to be, we're his brother, we're his sister. And that's all based on what he did. And if you look at that and realize that that is complete and nothing can take that away and that we're a family, then it changes a person's whole perspective when you talk to them about God. And so when we go through, that, that's my goal, is to just give little nuggets to people who are hopeless and, and, and tell them that they're part of a family. And because of what Jesus did, it's guaranteed that they will be with God forever. And that's all I got. Well, that's a high note, I was yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Appreciate it, man. Thanks. Okay. Thanks. You're free to go now. You're un untethered now. <laughs> uh, the Garden of Gethsemane, I, I, I agree. That's a fascinating scene. And... Scott, do you, you agree that I think the garden was the, was the, the crisis? Yes. 
As, as crazy as this might sound, I think that everything after the garden was easier because you had the surrender. You know how, you know how easier trials are when you, just, when you finally let go of the resistance? It's the resistance. It's that meeting it and overcoming that. And, you know, I think, um, you know, Jesus going to pray three times as that, well. Yeah, that, that's significant. I didn't realize he prayed three times. Yeah, and, and he didn't hear anything. You know, if, that's brutal. If, if you're told something, you must do this, and you know, because Jesus knew, like he knew everything the Father wanted him to do up until that point, I think. And for us, for me anyway, it's difficult if you don't actually know what to do. If I have to do something difficult, you know, if someone stole my daughter and was, you know, driving away, I know what I have to do. I got to yeah. chase him down yeah. and and do and whatever kill I have. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. But if uh, maybe I should do this, maybe. So Jesus didn't know. Right. So he had to trust the plan and have that faith and that was that was hard for him that was the struggle but yeah after that once he got captured then he had no choice then, then I think he I think he knew that it's going to be over soon I mean I mean to me his whole life the shadow that cross is hanging over his whole life you know how it is when something terrible happens to you and you dwell on it and then every once in a while you, you forget it and you're having a conversation with somebody and then that thing comes back. You know, that sick feeling or at, at night you wake up from a nice sleep and then the first thing, first conscious moment you remember that thing. I think that happened to Jesus his whole life. And I think that once he got over the crisis of is there another way, then, then I thought that I, I really think at, when he was captured, and had his hands tied behind his back, I really think it was like, oh, whew, now it's going to be over soon. Yeah. Hours. It's now. Sure. Difficult hours. But it does tell you something about prayer. That, I mean, this is real. This wasn't an act mm -hmm. in the Garden of Gethsemane. We, we, we know Jesus knows he's not omniscient, I believe, like God is omniscient. Do you agree? I agree. So he thinks... It's not play acting, so I think Jesus thinks there could be another way. And Paul tells us in Philippians 4, 6, let your requests be made known to God. And then it, what, doesn't, what it doesn't say after that, and then God will grant you your request, does not say that. It says, let your request be made known to God, and then the peace of God will be garrisoning your hearts. And that's just what happened with Jesus Christ, our Savior. After he made his request well, known. I don't think he'd be sweating blood either if he knew exactly what to do, you know. No, exactly. I mean, I don't know how you sweat blood, but I, I, I'm, I'm sure that somebody says there's a, a physiological, we have some nurses in the crowd, extreme but. Extreme anxiety. Extreme anxiety. Okay, well that, that makes perfect sense then. You yeah. wouldn't be like that if you knew exactly what to do. You know, I, I think he, he did <laughs> believe that there might be another way and, uh, you know, he didn't know for sure, so yeah, that was the struggle. And I wonder how he, I mean, God didn't say anything to him, so I wonder what happened in his mind that sealed the deal like there is no other way. I think because he didn't hear anything. I mean, yeah. Is that where God had forsaken him? No, I don't, well, God didn't forsake him. suggested, I'm, I'm sorry. But no, go ahead, go ahead. When, when Christ was being crucified, he cried out, my God, my God, why am I? And it's been suggested that it was in the garden that he had forsaken him. Okay, Dale, Dale is asking about when did God forsake Christ. This is a, this is a great question. I, I have a thought on this. And it's that in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, Paul says, God was in Christ conciliating the world to himself. I, think, I don't think God forsook Christ. I think in Christ's consciousness, in Christ's experience, he felt betrayed and forsaken. So I don't believe that he was actually forsaken, but that doesn't take away his feeling that he was. You agree, Dale? Right, right. And, I, and in the garden, uh, I think the silence of God. Yeah, I think, it, the, I think you gotta think about you know, that he required of Christ, his faith required him to be out of communication. Yes. He's bearing everything. That's what faith because is about. God, the Father, is right there with him, talking him through it the whole there, time. There's no faith. Then he's relying strictly, you know, on 
the communication that he's having, not on his faith right. that God had not abandoned him. That's a great point. That he was carrying out a mission, and it was all on his shoulders in a relative sense. Yeah, of course. Yeah, no, that that's a that's a great point. But I mean, as Dale's saying, I mean, you're talking Jesus Christ who saw everything the Father was doing. He was always in communion with him. So that night he heard nothing. So in a real sense, yeah, God from Jesus' perspective From Jesus' perspective was not there. Was not he, there he, to answer him. But he did he did send uh, celestial beings to to minister to him right after that, did he not? Which probably that, helped. That is true, yeah. And, yeah, and, and then and when the soldiers came to arrest him and they said, are you, are you the one we're looking for? I am he, and they fell backwards. That would have been impressive too. That would have, <laughs> I think that would have assured him that God is here, you know? Yeah. I haven't yeah. lost it, I still have it. And of course he had to have still had it because he, even on the cross, he had to have had the ability to come down. He had to have had the ability, and of course he did, because we know he laid down his life, his own life. They could not take his life from him. He laid it down. So when the priests came, and damn those priests, how could they? How could they torment someone who's on a cross? I mean, like, they come in and, and they make fun of him. I mean, and they say, oh, you saved everybody else. You healed all these people. Why don't you heal yourself? Why don't you come down from the cross? And man, if, any, if there was ever a temptation to come down the cross and destroy every one of those sons of bitches, that would have been the time. <laughs> but he didn't, but he didn't. He said, he, even like he said to Pilate, it's not my hour, it's not my hour, it's not my hour. I mean, you know, it's not my time to rule, I should say. He, he told Pilate, this isn't the realm of my, yeah, my, of my rulership. This world. And Pilate wanted to set him free after that. He acknowledged, he gave Pilate acknowledgement that you have power here because this is your realm, this is not my realm, otherwise my, my, my friends, my servants would be racing to rescue me, but, ah. Oh. Could, it, could it also have been though that he was so fully identifying with, with um, the old humanity? God was forsaking that. You see what I'm saying? Yeah, he yeah. Was, he the, was one that, he's saying, yes, I, the, I am forsaking that, I'm making something that's a, better, I'm killing that and I'm bringing New forward, you see. That's a and that's that a good cry, distinction, yeah. That cry was identification with man. That's a good distinction. I never thought of that actually. That it was the old humanity that was being forsaken by God. Maybe not Jesus Christ personally, but the old humanity that was clinging to that Him. He had to be made like us in, in all ways. Right. To be, you know, what what He was for us. So. And, and there, there, there's a sick teaching going around. I don't know if any of you have heard it. So I've seen it maybe somewhere, even in my, some of the comments on my videos, but people are starting to teach that Satan is not an actual being, mm -hmm. right? That he's just uh, the, metaphor. The upper, a metaphor of evil right. or something. Right. Yeah, well, well, who was Jesus wrestling with in the wilderness, you know, mm -hmm. after his 40 days of fasting? Who was, who was tempting him? Because th this is, is related to the Garden of Gethsemane because Christ was tempted to take his power then. I always found it comforting what Christ said because there's plenty of nights I stay up all night praying and I don't hear squat. And I end up falling asleep thinking, God, for are you know. You, so you, you fall asleep at peace. Christ was showing his humanity there. Isn't, it, isn't yeah. that a Psalm of David? In a Psalm of David, my God, my God, way ahead. It's in the Psalm of David, yeah. Yes. I think it's Psalm 22. Yeah, I think so. Yeah. Uh, I think what's interesting in, uh, when Jesus said, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me, that a lot of people don't consider that uh, the rest of the context of the psalm. Right. And I, I think um, um, we think in a certain linear um, Greek way, um, and the Hebrews had a certain way of invoking the whole context of something. It would be similar to say, uh, for us to say, we the people, that calls into mind the entire Declaration of Independence. And with, uh, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? It calls to mind the whole psalm, which many Israelites would have been familiar with. And what's interesting is that at the end of the psalm, um, in, starting in verse 29, it says, um, no, verse 27, all the ends of the earth shall remember and turn to the Lord, and all the families of the nations shall worship before you. So this whole titanic struggle that he is willing to identify with humanity, in his mind, 
being so thoroughly immersed in the scriptures, it's going to end up uh, with um, all the ends of the earth turning to his father. And so I think that uh, the abandonment would have been Gethsemane, but I think it was, in a sense, a, a note of triumph. As you know, and I got to say this, I've often thought of, you know, how you do endure that incredible pain and agony, not only the physical pain of being crucified, but the spiritual battle that you're waging against the principalities, the powers of darkness. And the verse that, I think it's in Hebrews, right? It says, for the joy set before him, he endured the cross. I make a big deal out of that verse. You guys probably heard me say it, but mm -hmm. to, to me, there was some, I think, you know, when, uh, Paul says we will not, none of us will be tempted above what we are able, but God will provide, concordance says, the sequel, the outcome. God will show us the outcome. I think that Jesus Christ on the cross saw the outcome of his work. Maybe he saw the all in all. <coughs> Who knows what God showed him? But it does say, for the joy set before him, he endured the cross. Is that literal? Was there a literal... Did he see a vision? Did God give him something in order to, to look at that would maybe provide endorphins? Let's speak in human terms. He was a man on that cross that would take away some of the pain. Because I, I think of Stephen. Yes. Yeah. Here's a man getting large rocks thrown at him, and he has a raptured look on his face, and he's talking, and he sees, I see the Son of uh, Man standing at the right hand of God while he's getting hit with large rocks. There's something going on there. In that case, we know he sees a vision. I see the Son of God standing at the right hand of God, Son of Man standing at the right hand of God. So are we not to suppose that in this terrible hour at, on the cross that God gave Christ a similar vision? Chris, you got something to say, then we'll take a break after this. Oh, um, maybe, thing, maybe it was silent up until he was getting ready to die on that, that cross. That's when, that's when Stephen, he, he, God may have been silent to him right, right up until that point. When the, yes, that's a great point. Right up until the point. You know, we, we, in our imaginations, we sometimes ask ourselves, could I endure that? Could I go through that? What kind of metal do I have? Could I get through a trial like that or any of the any of the martyrs who died these horrible deaths, but I'm convinced that God will not give you the endurance to do that until it's needed. All your imaginations in the world, God's not going to protect you from your fantasy world about all the terrible things that could happen. That's why we can't project horror into the future, because God's not going to protect you from your own, from your own phantasms, right? But when the time comes to go through it at that hour, then you get the ticket, you get this. And see, nobody's ever been able to come back from, say, being burned at the stake and say, you know, it wasn't that bad. I, I thought, you know, <laughs> I said, you know, it wasn't that bad. I thought it was going to be, I thought uh, I, all night I, I dreamed about how horrible it was. And then when I'm there, it's like, yeah, I, I got these wonderful feelings and these endorphins <laughs> running through my, I, I'm not even kidding. How do these people like Peter, John, and James and John come out of the Sanhedrin praising God after getting, getting beaten? Yeah. Paul and Silas singing hymns in the inner jail in Philippi after getting beaten by rods. What's going on here? I'll tell you what's going on here. These people are getting something when they need it. And so our imagine, don't, just stop it, stop it. <laughs> Stop imagining the terrors of the future. God's not going to give you the ticket for that until it happens. All we can deal with is the present. There's enough evil, as our Lord said, in the present, this state. So don't go beyond it. Amen. Amen. Okay, let's take a break. and uh, 10 minutes.